In Sochi, the F2 sprint race was suspended after Jack Aitken and Luca Giotto destroyed large sections of the barrier at Turn 3. As the barrier needed extensive work to be repaired in time for the upcoming F1 race, the race was not restarted and, as the rules demanded, the race results were wound back a couple of laps, so Aitken and Giotto both got a handful of points despite being in bits and pieces by the side of the track. Two race weekends earlier in Monza, a red flag suspended the race and allowed Lance Stroll to run an effective no-stop race as he could change his tyres during the race suspension. So while a red flag seems one of the simplest of the many Marshall flags, a red flag means the race is stopped, it carries with it a lot of rulebook quirks that leave people scratching their heads. So what are the red flag and race suspension rules and how can they so easily twist up the result of the race? I started watching F1 right at the end of the 90s, just before throwing a red flag went massively out of fashion. Often a big crash on lap 1 would result in the race being stopped, the mess being cleaned up and everyone going back to the grid to have another crack at the race from the beginning. In fact, back in those days the team had a complete spare car made up and ready to go, so even if you did crash out at turn 1, you could be back in your normal grid slot for the restart. But at the turn of the century, the race director favoured keeping the race going with safety cars, much to the surprise of commentators as they got used to the change in philosophy. A huge accident! Oh my goodness! Ruben's rear wings off, there goes Ralph Schumacher! And I think I'm going to have to restart it. There's a total carnage. It started with Ralph hitting the back of Barrichello. I don't see a red flag situation at the moment. Can't see any signs on our computers that they have the red flags out, but surely they must do so. The safety car is on the circuit. They're so they, maybe they're going to try and run it behind the safety car while they clear the mess. Nonetheless, a red flag is still pretty rare, having only been thrown 73 times in F1's history. Of course, F1 is broadcast live around the world and ideally needs to stick to its designated time slot and not overrun. Stopping a race adds a lot of time in getting the race restarted, whereas a safety car keeps things running, is quicker to return to race running from, and crucially continues to count through the laps. So red flags now tend to be reserved for times when it's dangerous to keep going or when the race cannot easily return to full active running. So in cases of extreme rainfall with no sign of abating, if a barrier needs extensive repair, if there's debris all over the track that could cause punctures and damage to the cars, if there's an injured driver that needs attending to, that's when you're likely to see a red flag thrown and the race fully suspended. Since 2015, a red flag has indicated drivers are meant to return to the pit lane and park in the fast lane, that's this outer lane furthest from the pit stop area, in race order. Before that, they used to park up on the grid, but that just meant teams had to drag all their equipment out again, which is slower. If any cars can't make it back to the pit lane due to like a blocked track, they'll be brought back and slotted into the correct order. If any cars were already in the pit lane when the red flag was shown, they too will be slotted into the right order in the fast lane. But if the car was in the garage, they have to go to the back if they choose to rejoin the race. Controversially, teams can do quite a lot while the cars are parked up during the race suspension. In fact, there are nine legal types of work allowed by the cars. Starting the engine, adding compressed gases into the pneumatics, adding those cooling devices they plonk onto stationary cars, changing the brake ducts, changing the radiator ducts, changes for driver comfort, repairing accident damage, and changing the front wing setup. But they can't change the front wing, they can only fiddle with the existing wing. And they can change the car's tyres. This means that in the current rule set where drivers must run multiple compounds per race, if the red flag comes at just the right moment, you can switch to the alternate tyre without ever taking that additional 20 to 30 seconds it takes to make a pit stop. Lance Stroll did this in Monza, gaining about 24 seconds over some of his competitors by doing zero racing pit stops. Now there are three possible scenarios in changing tyres around race stoppages. You could have changed your tyres just before the red flag, which pretty normal result. You could change your tyres after the red flag, in which case you now might be in a tricky position as the field will be bunched up and your 25 second stop will cost you more places if you can't wait for the field to spread out. Or, as is currently allowed, you can stop during the red flag and lose no time. Though if stoppage occurs in the wrong phase of the race, you may still need to stop again later. The rule allowing teams to change tyres during red flags is an old one that existed before the rules mandated drivers use two compounds of tyre during the race. It presupposed the red flag would likely mean the need to switch to wet weather tyres or that cars might have damage or puncture concerns. In these cases, such changes make sense. And there's an argument to ban all of these team interventions, say for things like tyre blankets and cooling, unless there's a good reason, like a change in weather conditions or legitimate damage and puncture concerns. This could work, though we have to bear in mind 
getting permission for damage warriors takes some time, something the race organisers are looking to minimise in getting back to race running. If we're good to go racing again, after a 10 minute warning the safety car will lead the cars around for a single lap where the cars will line up again on the grid for a standing start. Of course if the weather's a bit dodgy they might do a few laps behind the safety car before lining up on the grid. And the weather might still be so wet that the race clerk decides to go with a rolling start instead as after normal safety car periods. And if the weather turns out to be too bad, the race can be resuspended and the safety car will just lead them back to the pit lane again. Now the length of a race is however many laps it is designated, or two hours of active running, whichever is completed first triggers the end of the race. But the clock for active running is stopped during a red flag and resumed once the cars leave the pit lane again, so that two hour clock doesn't keep ticking down during suspension. However, there is a hard limit on overall race time of four hours. So you can keep stopping the event all you want, but once you get to four hours from the moment the race started, the checkered flag will be shown and the race will come to an end, even without two hours of running. Which leads us to what happens if the race is just stopped by a red flag and not restarted? Maybe it's too rainy, maybe it got too dark, maybe time ran out. Well now we see another quirk of the rules. The official finishing results are not the running order at the moment the race was suspended. Instead we have to go back to the end of the penultimate lap before the lap during which the signal to suspend the race was given, which is a very confusingly phrased way of putting it. But this is how it works. If the leader is on lap 50, you look at the results as of the end of lap 48. But why? Well it's for reasons of official time and record keeping. Think about it like this. The leader completes circuits of the track. Every other car following them, even lapped ones, are on the same timekeeping lap. So as the leader passes the finish straight to complete a lap, the time for every following car is recorded until every car has passed. You'll see this as the timing tower and live timing screen fills up. Once every car has passed the finish line, the timekeeping for that lap is complete and the order for that lap is recorded. So let's say the leader is on lap 50 when the race is stopped. Let's ask, when was the last complete recorded lap? It wasn't at the end of lap 49, a lot of cars haven't passed the finish line to log their time yet. You have to go back to the end of lap 48 for the last time every single car passed the finish line. So that's why that is the official result on countback if a race is permanently suspended. And just for clarification, if a car has been lapped, I know it hasn't completed 48 laps, but it's still recorded as being on the same lap cycle as the leader. If the leader finishes a race, every car after them will also finish the race as soon as they complete that lap, regardless of whether they've done all the laps. The lap cars will just be recorded as plus one lap, plus two lap, etc. This means you can crash on a reg flag lap and still score points and be classified as finishing. It happened to Aiken and Giotto in Russia's F2 sprint race, and it happened to Alonso in Brazil when he finished on the podium despite his car being destroyed and Alonso himself being in the medical center while the podium ceremony was in full swing. It is also worth noting that if a race is stopped before 75% of the full race distance is completed, drivers will only score half points, which is why the record shows some drivers with half point totals. So there we have it, red flags and race suspensions can cause a fair bit of trouble and disrupt race results, but we all have to make compromises in how we run races and the real question is, are we always making the right balance of compromises? And most pressingly, should teams be allowed to fiddle with cars during stoppages? Thank you.